Hello and welcome to NACDL's webinar, Policing Body Cameras. I'm Jumana Musa. I'm the Senior Privacy and National Security Council here at NACDL. Uh, I would like to let you know this webinar is a collaboration with NACDL's Public Defense Department and is funded in part by a grant from the Bureau of Justice Assistance. NACDL would like to thank BJA for its continued support of training for public defense providers. A couple years ago, NACDL formed a task force in reaction to many high-profile shootings of unarmed black people by the police. At the time, there was a lot of interest in body cameras as a tool of accountability for these shootings. Mm -hmm. And NACDL also understood the reality of the rollout of these body cameras and the impact that they would have on the defense. And so a culmination of two years of work, about a month ago, NACDL issued a report called Policing Body Cameras, Policies and Procedures to Safeguard the Rights of the Accused, where the task force who had gone through months of hearing from witnesses, studying papers, studying motions and other issues, came up with a set of recommendations that was accepted by our board um, that we put forth in the paper. NACDL did in the report endorse body cameras, but only if they're implemented with these protections in place. And so as our next step, we've pulled together this webinar in order to talk through not just what kinds of policies and procedures defense attorneys should be pushing for as body cameras are implemented into their jurisdictions, but also what is the reality of defending cases in body camera jurisdictions and what you might need to know. There will be presentations from the three gentlemen to my right, and after that we will be taking questions. Questions will be taken by email. You can email them to me at jmusa at nacdl.org. We will do that again at the end of the presentations. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to a short survey. We'd appreciate it if you could take a moment to provide some feedback. Your feedback is important for NACDL to be able to continue providing training like this. So a quick introduction. We have next to me Barry Porter, who is a criminal defense attorney in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He was also a member of the NACDL task force that studied body cameras and he has been practicing in a jurisdiction where he actually helped negotiate the body camera policies as they were brought into play by a consent decree for the Albuquerque Police Department. To his right is Harlan Yu, who is a principal with Upturn. Uh, he is also a technologist and has studied body cameras from the perspective of the technology and also their impacts on civil rights and civil liberties. Mm -hmm. And then to his right is Seth Morris who up until last year was a public defender in Alameda County, California, where they have had body cameras since 2010, one of the longest uh, jurisdictions to be using body cameras. And he is in private practice now. We'll be able to talk to us about what is the reality of defending cases in a body camera jurisdiction. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Barry. Thanks, Jumana. So um, as criminal defense practitioners, we know that body cameras are really becoming a a big part of our reality in defending our clients and uh, we're seeing them uh, spread basically throughout all all the jurisdictions in the United States so in New Mexico where I'm from about half of our police agencies uh, em employ the use of uh, body cameras so um, what I'm going to talk about is basically as a criminal practitioner out in the field what can we do to um, help our communities implement the best uh, best practices, uh, uh, policies, and uh, equipment, and use, and, and, and create a discussion so that we create policies that are respectful and thoughtful, respectful of our clients. Of, of course, as criminal defense lawyers, we're concerned primarily about them, so respectful of the rights of the accused. Uh, respectful of uh, other citizens and their privacy interests, uh, respectful of vic victims of crime as well, and then, uh, yes, respectful of uh, law enforcement, uh, because uh, they're certainly a big uh, and key player uh, in this area. So as a little bit of background, uh, body cameras first started hitting uh, the streets, so to speak, in Albuquerque in 2010, and in 2012 they became mandatory. and kind of like we, we've seen throughout the country, what happened in Albuquerque was we had uh, 14 shootings of police officers uh, shooting citizens within a 12-month period. That caused a lot of alarm. We had uh, a number of fatalities. So a number of community groups rose, and some of the community groups that, that arose were actually victims of, of the police uh, excessive force. So families who had won uh, large awards against the police department 
said hey we we really need to get involved we need to start doing something so our local affiliate and so what I'm going to talk about is you know how to kind of build a coalition uh, so that you can make an impact in, in uh, the policies that are going to be implemented in your jur jurisdiction. So our local uh, New Mexico Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, headed by uh, our brilliant and ever-enthusiastic uh, Executive Director Kathy Anschelis, uh, she got involved with a number of community groups. And um, they included... Uh, well, eventually the Department of Justice got involved, but the local ACLU, domestic violence groups, uh, a lot of faith-based groups. And what Kathy got involved with was uh, a group called APD Forward. And the idea was, and as, as criminal defense lawyers, you know, if we just go and we say we want to change policies, uh, oftentimes we're not listened to, right? But if we're part of a coalition, a broad uh, citizen coalition, uh, then our voice is more uh, likely to be heard. So that coalition created a group called Albuquerque uh, Police Department Forward, APD Forward, and started uh, investigating policies, looking into what would be best practices and would best serve the people of New Mexico. So when I got involved to kind of look at, well, you're using these body cameras in the field, you're having these cases as part of your evidence, uh, what should our position be uh, as the New Mexico criminal defense lawyers or as defense lawyers, uh, defense lawyers in general? And it, I really had to step back and think, okay, is this something we want? Because I had been getting a lot of body camera footage, right? It comes with every single case that we were having in Albuquerque. And I would look at it and it would go, wow, this is a really mixed bag. It makes our clients look really bad because usually when we see our clients, they've been in custody and cleaned up and no longer under the influence. Um, so it makes our, our clients look bad. It solidifies evidence against our clients. Is this something that we want to uh, promote at all? But uh, kind of overall, the police oversight and the concerns about uh, police excessive force seem to really outweigh uh, the, the cons. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is, well, what, what should our position be? And just going to kind of go through uh, a few different scenarios about how it's good how body camera footage is good for uh, our clients and bad for our clients so this first one and these are from actual cases that I had if we uh, look at the picture to the left this was in federal court it was a motion to suppress and the police officer in his statement said he stopped and seized my client who happened to be holding a handgun and some drugs uh, because his vehicle was blocking the roadway. So upon looking at the, the body camera footage, it's able to pull some stills and show, well, that's not blocking the roadway. Show the federal court that and the U.S. attorney and, and get that case uh, completely dismissed. Now, the other one to the right there is a very typical DWI, and this is going to really impact DWI practitioners because th those field sobriety maneuvers that we used to kind of be able to question in court and question uh, the, the account of officers is now recorded on video. Uh, so in this particular case, the officer was claiming that my client didn't do the uh, heel-to-toe uh, exercise correctly because there was gaps. And this, this obviously shows that there weren't and, that, and the type of shoes that uh, she was wearing and the difficulties that she was dealing with. And then the, le the one on the far right, this one actually kind of like shocked me out of my chair when I was watching this uh, body cam video of an officer actually emptying out the original plastic baggies uh, purportedly full of methamphetamine and um, throwing those original plastic baggies in the trash can. So just a clear destruction of evidence, of course, because I'm going to be using a defense of my client never touched these baggies. Let me do some forensic testing on them, some fingerprints or some DNA. Um, also resulting in, in a good outcome for the client. So good stuff, but there's bad stuff as well. Uh, and bad stuff as far as uh, on the, there's a, it's just a still here, but what, what, the footage showed, and this is of, of a homicide, is of six police officers, so six different angles, running into a homicide scene. You can hear one of the shooting victims groaning and basically gasping for breath, 
And then you actually see the other shooting victim die. So incredibly powerful evidence that some prosecutors are going to try and put into court. Uh, so uh, we have to be thoughtful about that. It also memorializes evidence against our clients where uh, we can see here in the middle picture of the head wounds that we can obviously tell that they're uh, fresh and, and they corroborate a victim's uh, story in a case. Uh, uh, to the far right, we have uh, how body cameras, well, oftentimes police officers don't have a field investigator come out, don't document things, but now with the camera, it's all documented, so then this was a criminal property damage case. You can see the tire is slashed. The, the government now has that uh, in their evidence uh, toolbox for trial. And then lastly, I haven't personally represented this uh, elderly woman, uh, but, <laughs> but what I've been shocked to see is the behavior of our clients sometimes uh, on, on video footage. and. Uh, you know, this is something that the judge may see and certainly the prosecutors are going to see and, and going to have an impact on how we are able to resolve cases. Nevertheless, it really seems like cameras are inevitable and as Jumana mentioned, the uh, NACDL board really uh, grappled with this issue because there are serious privacy concerns and all sorts of implications and that's why the board and in this report, policing body cameras, cautiously endorses the use of body cameras. And I think that's uh, a wise way to put it. Uh, and the reason why they cautiously uh, um, endorse it is because body cameras uh, really present a multitude of issues. Now I'm just going to outline just a couple here because when when I first started grappling with this issue I thought oh it's kind of a no-brainer right I want to have a video I want to be able to question what the cop said I want to have those witness statements uh, memorialized. Well it isn't really uh, that much of a no-brainer. Uh, there's good and there's bad for our clients. It memorializes exculpatory evidence but on the bad side it memorializes inculpatory evidence. It corroborates our clients uh, explanation of events. So that's uh, something that we haven't had before and I know Seth's going to talk about this a little bit later about motions to suppress, right? In a motion to suppress hearing generally the court was left with the officer's rendition of, of uh, what happened at a stop or a search and then our clients. Well we know who traditionally wins and loses that credibility battle, right? We lose, we lose it. Um, but with video uh, we have a new tool. Uh, to show the, the court exactly what really happened. On the bad side, uh, it, it does memorialize witness statements, so as practitioners we have to be thoughtful of make, making sure that our Sixth Amendment jurisprudence is, is advanced, uh, that these videos are not brought into court without the actual accuser being brought into court to be confronted. Um, uh, another big impact that this has had on my criminal defense practice and, and everybody in body camera jurisdictions is it's a lot more time intensive. You have to sit and watch these videos because if you don't watch them, are you effective counsel? Right? You haven't looked through all of the evidence. So uh, it's important for practitioners to develop ways to summarize and, and view all of this. It's also become, just as far as office management issue, how are you going to store all this digital data? We're now going to have huge amounts, terabytes and terabytes of data, and we also have to, as, as criminal defense lawyers, maintain uh, our files and keep, keep all of this stuff for several years, depending on your jurisdiction. So Fourth Amendment and privacy concerns also uh, are a, a big issue for us to look at when police walk into somebody's home. Is that a search? Uh, when they you know, take uh, photographs uh, uh, and videos of contraband around? Uh, also privacy, privacy concerns. So what this opens the door to was uh, kind of huge privacy issues. I know Harlan's going to talk a little bit about having the government have uh, enormous amounts of video of our citizens and uh, biometric technology and all, all sorts of things that uh, have long-term impacts. 
Now, again, these are just a few of the issues. Let me cover a couple of more victims' rights. So at the task force, we heard from domestic violence groups. We heard from folks with Black, Black Lives Matter uh, to know uh, and to learn a little bit about how this might impact them. Is this going to make victims less likely to report? Are they going to be less likely to want to give a statement? knowing that it's there's a video and depending on your jurisdiction that video could either end up on youtube or facebook the next day depending on how accessible these videos are in your jurisdiction that brings up the public records access issue so i had to scour new mexico's uh, in inspection of public records statute because in our jurisdiction it's different from state to state and maybe county to county all of these videos once they're uploaded they're public record and I can request one online and have it the next day. So that, that's an, uh, an incredible issue as far as victims' concerns, and especially when you're talking about offenses of a really sensitive nature like sexual assault. So not as simple as it seems. Then public safety and discipline. There's, there's studies that show, and uh, they haven't really been, um, I think, substantiated enough, that having people on camera uh, makes them behave better, right? So if an officer says, oh, by the way, this is being recorded, the officer supposedly is going to behave better and the person who is encountering the police are going to behave better. But there's also studies that show if an officer has discretion of when to turn the camera on, that could actually cause an escalation of the situation. So all the more reason that us as uh, criminal defense lawyers have involvement and input into the implementation of these programs. So, um, wh where to start? And I think that the, what I mentioned earlier is a lot of times uh, people don't want to hear so much or they discount what a criminal defense lawyer is going to say, but they won't necessarily discount what a whole coalition is saying. So build a coalition. Reach out to civ uh, civil rights groups in your area and uh, privacy rights groups, uh, different uh, uh, social services agencies like domestic violence uh, groups, sexual assault uh, victim advocates, uh, legal aid organizations, certainly the Public Defender's Office and, or any legal aid agency in your jurisdiction needs to be involved. But think outside the box. Think about people or the families or churches that were involved in protests about excessive use of force by police. Get those people involved because the more folks that you show up with when you're going to the Chief of Police or you're meeting with Department of Justice representatives, the more people you have around the table, uh, the more impact you're going to have on, how, on what policies are implemented. One of the uh, most powerful people that we had uh, with Albuquerque uh, APD Forward uh, was a lawyer whose son was mentally ill and was shot by police. He won a huge settlement, but he was able to come and talk to the mayor, the chief of the police, and talk about the impact uh, that excessive use of force has had on his family. Another, uh, another group that's, that's affected is hospitals and medical providers and homeless shelters. Right? You, you think about HIPAA impacts, right? So when an, when an officer goes into a hospital room to go interview a victim, well, isn't that sort of medical, uh, medical information that they're, they're taking in? So some of the hospitals and the emergency rooms in New Mexico were saying, you can't use your camera in our emergency room. So bring these people on as well uh, and, and have them uh, involved in the process. And then study up on best practices. And I can tell you, so the, this report that uh, NACDL issued. I'm really proud of NACDL for doing this and providing this for our membership. I'm proud. I know the board probably had to grapple about this because, like I said, it's a real mixed bag. But this is uh, this policing body camera report really gives a roadmap of 10 key principles that you want to have uh, in your particular uh, community or uh, law enforcement agency. And it brings out things that, you know, as I read the report, I think, wow, if I only would have known that. Or had we started um, uh, Albuquerque's body camera program knowing some of this, 
these things, we could have foreclosed some issues like video tampering. It's going to, and that's going to be rampant throughout our country. But if a jurisdiction gets ahead of this and says, hey, why would we have law enforcement uh, maintain and control the release of this? Right? Why not have an independent agency? Right? Because as criminal defense lawyers, we say this often, evidence doesn't belong to one party. Right? Evidence is evidence. And if we want to protect the integrity of it, then have it maintained by a third party. Have your county council come up with uh, an agency, an agency that's separate from your law enforcement agency that maintains uh, the footage, controls access to it, does the redactions so that it's, um, the integrity is assured. And how we sell all of, the, all of these things and how I approached uh, the folks in Albuquerque when we're dealing with our mayor and our city council is as practitioners and then as this coalition, we, hey, um, Mayor, we want to make sure that Albuquerque has the best body cam program in mm -hmm. the nation. Why can't we lead the nation? We have all these other uh, jurisdictions that are having issues, but if we follow these principles, we're going to create uh, a body camera system that has the most integrity and is the most reliable for our community. So I really encourage everybody to download the report, read the report, and um, it also has a, an incredible bibliography uh, to all the other different reports. So what the task force did, uh, the NACDL task force, is interviewed over 16 witnesses, reviewed hundreds of different reports and treatises on uh, body camera implementation and the issues, read all of the law enforcement things, even uh, some reports from the UK, right, because body cameras are really uh, present in Europe review policies of other leading jurisdictions. So see who's leading, see what kind of policies they're implementing. But don't stop there because a lot of the 10 principles that are talked of in, the, in our uh, body camera report, they're not implemented in jurisdictions. So we really have to, have to uh, take, the, take charge and, and lead a coalition to make the best practices uh, work for our communities. Do some uh, standard operating procedure analysis for the law enforcement agencies. Now this is sort of giving into one of the principles, ideally we don't want body cameras to be owned uh, by the law enforcement agency. Right now, the, and I know Harlan's going to talk about this, the vendors lobby, lobby our law enforcement agencies like crazy, but if we get in, get in front of it, uh, perhaps we can uh, have the uh, body camera apparatus that's set up in our communities be more independent. Review the studies and, and start getting them to your policymakers. Some of the other issues, and I know Seth is going to hit these, are listed here as far as just implementing this at a law firm when you have a criminal defense practice. So we want to have defense access as soon as possible. And why shouldn't it be immediate? In Albuquerque, the, the police have to load up their footage by the end of their shift. It goes up onto a website. It's, it seems to be an obsequious website, uh, evidence.com. Uh, but uh, everybody should have access immediately. Other things to think about are storage requirements, our audio video. You've got to upgrade your computer, make sure you can do video editing and capturing of images. Uh, it, have a close look at the use of force uh, review policy. So one of the things that's talked about in the task force repor report is if an officer is involved in a use of force incident, do they get to look at the video before they write up their report? What does that do as far as their perception? And is that fair and, uh, compared to the other witnesses who won't have the opportunity to review a blow-by-blow memorialization of what happened and then uh, what's really key and this is outlined in the report as well is disciplinary action and enforcement of whatever policies are set up uh, one of the biggest policies is take the discretion away from the officer they shouldn't have the discretion of when to activate and not activate their cameras because what will happen is they'll use excuses or signs that, that they can give each other uh, to 
to shut the camera down uh, and then we won't have that. So who, the policy makers that you want to approach, of course, your state legislators, if you have any electronic uh, recording statutes, beef those up. Uh, talk to your city council and your mayor, uh, review the law enforcement SOPs and, and put and have input into those. We have a process in Albuquerque where we're able to do that. Get with the judges and the rules committees uh, in your local jurisdictions about uh, primarily about when these things have to be disclosed. Get these in black and white in your jurisdiction. And kind of just lastly, uh, I just would re reiterate how we sell this as criminal practitioners in the field is we want to make it the most reliable, the, 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 the best practices uh, uh, setup that we have in our body camera uh, area in our community. We want to make our community a leader uh, and uh, help uh, ensure that uh, excessive use of force is, uh, that officers are held accountable, uh, but also uh, th this helps out the officers. So that's, that's what I have as far as the implementation, implementation and the input. Uh, please download a copy of the report and, and put it into action in your community. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Harlan Yu. Um, I'll be talking a bit about uh, local policies that are in place in uh, cities across the country and some of the technical aspects of cameras that I think are important for uh, criminal defense lawyers. Uh, so just to start uh, with a little bit of context and background, uh, my organization is called Upturn. We're based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're a combination of technologists and lawyers and policy people. Um, and we work at the intersection of uh, civil rights and social justice issues together with um, grassroots racial justice groups and national civil rights groups. Uh, my personal background is in computer science. Um, but my career uh, has been focused on bringing more technical depth and technical expertise into policy debates. Um, so you might be wondering, you know, how I got here to be talking about body-worn cameras, sitting here with Beth, uh, sorry, with Seth and Barry, uh, <laughs> who have actually practiced uh, criminal defense. Um, so like Barry, uh, you know, we work in coalitions. Um, we uh, work alongside a, a major civil rights coalition, um, and over two and a half years ago, um, you know, as departments have been increasingly adopting body-worn cameras, uh, the coalition turned its attention uh, to these new technologies that were being rolled out in streets across our country. Um, and so uh, in May of 2015, uh, Upturn helped to draft and coordinate the sign-on of a set of uh, civil rights principles uh, on body-worn cameras. Um, you know, these principles were endorsed by a wide range of civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy groups, uh, including the NAACP, the National Council of La Raza, the Urban League, the Leadership Conference, the ACLU, the Lawyers Committee, Million Hoodies, Colors of Change, and a number of other national uh, civil rights and civil liberties groups. Um, and in those principles, uh, you know, they recognize that, you know, without, uh, sorry, I can barely read that from here, without carefully crafted policies in place, um, these new technologies, uh, you know, might be used as instruments of injustice rather than tools for accountability. Um, it's important to note that this coalition who, who endorsed the set of principles, you know, not all groups endorsed body-worn cameras. Many groups didn't see body-worn cameras as a useful reform. Um, in fact, you know, lots of uh, these groups saw body-worn cameras as a system of mass surveillance, right? These are cameras that are worn by officers, primarily concentrated in communities of color, pointed out at the community, recording um, their activities and gathering evidence in the streets rather than pointed in at officers themselves. Um, and so these principles are uh, relatively closely aligned uh, with the NACDL uh, recommendations. Um, and so after the coalition put out these principles, the question then was, you know, what's actually happening in police departments across the country? Are departments, as they're implementing body-worn cameras, are they following the principles that we've set out? Um, so what we've done is, uh, together with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, uh, together uh, uh, with that organization, we put together uh, a major scorecard, the body-worn camera policy scorecard, where we compare and evaluate the body-worn camera policies from 50 major police departments across the country, across eight uh, civil rights criteria, the columns that you see here um, on, on this image. 
Um, and these criteria were derived from the principles that, that the coalition set out. Um, the goal of the scorecard uh, was to highlight promising approaches that some departments are taking and to identify opportunities where each individual department can improve. And so as Perry was saying, if you're looking for best practices and notable practices, um, our scorecard actually has a list of, in each area, departments that we believe are doing the best and have the best policies. And so we want to make this resource available to local advocates, to local city councils, to departments. Um, and so from this, inner, uh, this overview chart, uh, you could see the overall uh, picture of what we're kind of looking at across the country. Um, no department has a perfect policy, and you know there's some departments that have better policies in one area but falter in others. Um, but in our report, we dig into each specific policy for all 50 departments, and we rate them on a red, yellow, and a green scale with a very clear criteria. Um, and standards, and we pull out the specific policy provisions. Uh, so, you know, if you want to go see this, um, it's at bwcscorecard.org. Uh, find your local jurisdiction, your local department's policy, and see how it fares against uh, national standards. Um, but my goal today uh, is actually to discuss the technical aspects uh, of body-worn camera systems. And um, as I go through this, I don't want to take a technology first approach. I want to start with the important policy issues uh, based on this, uh, the scorecard criteria, um, and then discuss the specific technical features of camera technologies uh, that impact each policy area. And so I also want to note that uh, you know, there are lots of vendors and models of body-worn cameras out there. Um, the NIJ, the National Institute of Justice, put out a market survey of body-worn camera technologies uh, in November of last year, and they identified 66 camera models from 31 vendors, um, which is a lot of different kinds of cameras, a lot of small vendors as well. Um, but that said, uh, we probably all know that uh, the market is dominated uh, by Taser, now known as Axon. They just rebranded yesterday. Uh, and they had a major announcement yesterday, not to give their PR pitch, but they have uh, promised, or they want, to give all police officers in the United States free body cameras for a full year. Um, and obviously, I believe that departments need to be extremely cautious uh, uh, before jumping on that offer. Um, and so uh, during this webinar, um, you know, a lot of what I'll be talking about is the Axon uh, body-worn camera system because it's the most popular and it's most widely used. Um, and the one that I've most familiarized myself with, but obviously there are a lot of other cameras. So it's important to know in your jurisdiction exactly what vendor um, uh, your department is using. Um, and obviously too, the uh, technologies are moving really fast. Um, you know, I'm gonna discuss a little bit uh, what's available on the market today, what features are out there, um, but also we'll be talking a little bit about what might be coming down the line in terms of new technologies that vendors are gonna be putting into their camera systems. Um, and while I'm at it, um, I'm also going to point out uh, leading departments in each of the policy areas that have some of the best practices across the country. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Um, the first evaluation criteria uh, is the most simple. Um, and, you know, if a department's going to adopt body-worn cameras, obviously they should discuss um, why and the purpose uh, they want, uh, uh, of adopting cameras um, in their jurisdiction. Um, and so, uh, you know, departments should publish um, as a minimum baseline, the most recent version of its policy on its website in a location that's easy for the community to find. Pretty straightforward. Um, you might be surprised to know that uh, Pittsburgh and Detroit, two major cities um, who are starting to pilot body-worn cameras, uh, refuse to publish uh, their body-worn camera policies themselves. Um, and uh, that's problematic, even though lots of other departments are doing a much better job. San Francisco PD, for example, has a dedicated website. They have a public process. They had done biweekly meetings um, that were publicly documented with public drafts that the public could comment on. Uh, pretty good uh, community engagement, um, but that's not the case uh, across the country. Um, second, uh, we rate departments on whether uh, the policy limits officer discretion on when to record. And this is what you know Barry talked about. Um, officers shouldn't have discretion about when uh, cameras go on and off. Um, and we've seen many instances where cameras uh, were on officers and they haven't been on when they should. Uh, in Albuquerque, there was uh, a shooting in 2014 of a teenager, Mary Hawks, where there were six officers and six cameras, but not a single one um, had footage of the shooting itself. Um, and so vendors are working on auto activation features. Uh, so Axon uh, Taser has a, um, has a product called Signal Sidearm, where they put 
sensors in uh, gun holsters, and the cameras will automatically turn on as soon as an officer uh, pulls the gun. Um, and it also turns on all the other uh, body-worn cameras within a 30-foot radius. And so that, from a technology perspective, um, is a feature that can help reduce officer discretion by requiring um, cameras to be on. Um, there's also other uh, sensors that vendors are putting into place. Um, there are features where uh, cameras get activated uh, whenever the patrol car's light bar goes on or uh, when the door uh, of the squad car is opened. Um, but, uh, you know, these aren't foolproof technologies. I've heard stories, uh, literally, of cops climbing out of patrol car windows because they don't want to open the door uh, and activate their cameras. So watch out for that. <laughs> um, another uh, important feature that's widely adopted by vendors um, is what's called a 30-second pre-record functionality. So at the time that the officer actually hits the button to turn on their cameras, the camera will actually save the previous 30 seconds of video to try to make sure we capture and record um, the incidents that lead up to the officer hitting that button. Um, in many systems and in the taser system, uh, those 30 seconds are only audio, sorry, only video and no audio because officers are concerned about, you know, talking the squad car and having that picked up before hitting the button. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that's a tunable feature. Sometimes it's two minutes, sometimes it's 30 seconds, but I think that's also a really important technological safeguard uh, to make sure we try to capture as much as possible. Um, so from the point of view of a criminal defense lawyer, uh, understand what specific vendor and what specific features have been adopted. You know, their basic cameras and then a bunch of other add-on features like the Axon signal system. Um, and so, you know, if your department uses axon signal sensors and there isn't video for a particular kind of incident, that's a moment to ask exactly why, uh, you know, we don't have footage. Um, and if you uh, have a piece of video footage uh, from a taser camera and there's audio right away, you know, it might be possible that, uh, you know, the video was somehow cropped or cut because you don't have that 30 second buffer that's typically there for cameras. So that's just another thing to look out for. Um, on the policy side, in terms of uh, limiting officer discretion, departments actually do pretty well across the board uh, on paper. Uh, but as Barry was saying, you know, we're, we've been seeing a ton of operational difficulties. Uh, cameras have malfunctioned. Cameras fell off during the tussle. The battery died. Um, the camera uh, cord came loose. All sorts of, um, you know, what you might call excuses. Um, and so, you know, it's important that for a department that even has a good policy on paper that that policy is enforced um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So during those critical incidents where we do have a police shooting, um, that to, to make sure that the cameras are on. Um, third, uh, our scorecard looks at whether body-worn cameras address personal privacy concerns. And part of that is uh, to make sure that uh, individuals who are in front of cameras are actually notified that cameras are rolling. Um, you know, there's some features, pretty basic, easy to understand, uh, that help here. Some cameras have red lights, you know, to show that the camera's recording. Uh, some have uh, periodic uh, audible beeps um, that are notifications. Um, e some cameras even have uh, outward-facing LED screens, right, that make it obvious that you're interacting with a cop that has, has, has a video camera. Um, but it's important to point out that, you know, also some officers have objected to these, uh, these signals, especially uh, some of the visual features, because they're worried from a safety perspective at night uh, that will make them stand out in a way that might put a target on their back. Um, I'm not quite in a position to, to, to uh, 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 really uh, uh, evaluate the merits of that, um, but that's just to point out something that officers have have said. Um, and so in pointing out uh, a department uh, that's doing well here, Philadelphia has a pretty nuanced policy, right? It's obviously a balance between keeping the cameras on and turning the cameras off um, for victims, especially domestic violence victims, sexual assault victims, where the officer, you know, comes on scene and might, uh, might capture on video some uh, pretty horrific uh, uh, um, scenes. Uh, fourth, um, our scorecard looks at prohibiting officer pre-report viewing. Um, and this is one of the most hotly contested policy issues that Barry um, alluded to, which is when officers are allowed to watch footage and whether they're allowed to watch footage before completing their initial reports. Um, obviously, by watching video, it will shape and skew people's memories about what he or she actually experienced. 
Um, in the worst case, it allows the officers to conform his or her written report uh, just to what uh, the video shows rather than giving a full explanation of the officer's experience. Um, the other concern here with pre-report viewing is that because officers get this advantage of watching footage and other eyewitnesses don't, it actually makes officer reports more accurate when compared to the video. And obviously when you have an officer, an accurate uh, account that is artificially uh, improved by video and another eyewitness that didn't have that advantage, um, credibility uh, in the courtroom uh, is, uh, it creates an uneven playing field of credibility in the courtroom. And that's also a major issue. Um, and so, you know, in terms of technical features, um, body cameras uh, oftentimes themselves have screens on them. Taser cameras don't, but there are um, uh, cell phone applications uh, called TAC, uh, Axon View that basically pairs with those cameras such that officers are able to view the footage in the field. Uh, some cameras also pair with um, the squad car video screen so they can watch a video in the squad car. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's important that vendors, as they're building these technologies, build in um, safeguards or at least an audit trail that allows us to backtrack and to know when officers watched video and the sequencing between watching the video and when the report was actually com completed. Fifth, um, the scorecard looks at whether departments limit retention of footage. And this is really a privacy concern um, and a cost concern. Um, departments typically will manually flag footage that has evidentiary or accountability value, right? So if it's a video that's relevant to a case um, or relevant to uh, somebody's miscon police misconduct complaint, that footage clip will be automatically flagged. But here we're talking about all of the other mundane footage, the hours and hours of footage that don't have any uh, evidentiary or um, accountability value. And our belief is that that footage should be automatically deleted um, it, after a relatively short period of time. Our scorecard uh, insists on six months because we believe that gives um, individuals um, adequate time to file a police misconduct complaint. Um, but the worry here is that if departments keep mountains of footage around, um, that they'll later mine that footage um, and use that um, using uh, you know, facial recognition, other uh, new uh, artificial intelligence um, tools to automatically search that footage and use that as an investigatory tool um, rather than as a accountability tool. Um, you know, we're also uh, worried about data breaches. Um, you know, now that there are, you know, there's uh, thousands of hours of footage out there, if the uh, footage gets uh, accessed in an unauthorized way, that could violate people's privacy in a major way. Um, one other thing to point out, and one other reason why uh, footage should be retained for only a little bit amount of time, is that this is how vendors make money, right? They don't make money off of selling the camera hardware. They make money by locking departments and cities into long-term contracts for the ongoing storage and retention of footage. Um, and so uh, by keeping a relatively short retention period, this is also good for taxpayers. Um, so. Um, a lot of the back end systems, you know, obviously when a officer gets back to, to dish, uh, a station, will take off the body camera, dock it um, into the system. The video will automatically upload into a back end evidence management system. Um, Taser system is called evidence.com. Uh, there are features where officers can tag pieces of footage to put retention uh, periods on those pieces of evidence. Um, and after that retention period expires, that uh, piece of video will automatically be deleted. Um, obviously, this is incumbent on officers and departments to actually tag things in the right way. And so if things aren't adequately tagged, they won't get deleted or they might get deleted too soon or too early. Um, sixth, uh, we look at uh, whether departments pr protect footage against tampering and misuse. And so in the policies, a lot of policies actually don't say explicitly that officers aren't allowed to delete or modify footage. And so just having that baseline policy in there obviously is important. Um, but the other piece of this is uh, whether or not the body-worn camera system keeps an audit log um, of how camera footage is used. And so evidence.com automatically keeps an lo audit log about who and when uh, footage, uh, who accessed footage and when that happened. Um, and newer uh, cameras also on the camera itself, as I was saying with pre-report viewing, also uh, keeps, it, keeps track of when officers 
uh, uh, watch footage in the field. And so, you know, the audit log is obviously critical for trying to piece together after the fact the chain of custody uh, and who has had access to footage. Um, but obviously, uh, this also doesn't prevent uh, so-called shoulder surfing, where you have one officer who sits there, logs in, watches the footage, and you have other uh, cop buddies standing right behind them, uh, behind their shoulder, watching that footage too. So, you know, it's not a perfect uh, log of who has had access or not. Uh, seventh, um, we look at, uh, you know, obviously if body-worn cameras uh, are going to be a transparency tool, there are major questions about when footage is available to the public, and in particular, whether footage is available to individuals filing police misconduct complaints. Um, the policy that I think uh, at least is a minimal standard is uh, by using access control. So for individuals who are recorded on camera, those individuals get a special right to, uh, to, view, uh, to view footage. So Washington, D.C., for example, has a policy in place where if you are a recorded individual, you can walk into a district station, fill out a form about the approximate time and place that the incident happened, and you can go in with your lawyer uh, and actually watch that footage. In some cases, I think in Las Vegas, um, they also uh, allow you to request to make a copy of that footage and take that with you. Um, important transparency safeguard, but very few departments are actually uh, doing this. And I think that's a best practice that needs to spread. Um, I think the reason why that's important is because, you know, you have to balance transparency and privacy. And a lot of departments right now are, um, frankly, uh, uh, I don't know if a bit lazy is the right uh, word, but they just rely on their decades old um, public records laws. Um, and those are really ill suited for body worn camera video, because it's a binary situation. It's either it's public or it's not. Um, Public records laws obviously have uh, uh, pretty broad uh, investigative and privacy exemptions, which oftentimes means that, for example, in California, even though um, camera footage is uh, classified as a public record, um, there's no obligation on the department uh, to actually publish that because uh, they can claim an investigatory records uh, exemption. Um, finally, um, and this is one of the more uh, future-leaning issues. Um, we believe that uh, departments need to limit uh, the use of biometric technologies like facial recognition together with uh, their camera systems. So body-worn cameras and facial recognition, in my opinion, is a particularly dangerous combination, and it's a real slippery slope. Um, Taser just acquired two uh, artificial intelligence companies, notably a company called Dextro, um, what they want to do is to uh, do automated analysis of footage, and they're trying to make footage more searchable. Um, what they'll be able to do in the future is automatically detect particular objects and movements in the footage. Um, for example, you could search for an officer foot chase or a traffic stop or cars or a gun, um, and it will automatically try to detect that in, in the footage. Um, they say they're doing object detection and motion detection, uh, and they say they aren't yet doing face recognition. Um, but it's only a matter of time. And the CEO of Taser actually said as much in a public forum that face recognition is a uh, feature that they're planning to add to their camera systems. Um, it's an alluring prospect for police departments who want to improve their investigatory tools. Um, and, uh, you know, what this might look like is an uh, officer walking down the street with a body cam with a paired smartphone that shows in real time uh, what's happening uh, from the camera. Um, face recognition technologies will automatically scan the faces of everybody, uh, every person that the officer encounters, and does an automatic lookup in police and intelligence databases and could notify the officer in real time uh, whether there's an open warrant um, or other, uh, you know, criminal history or criminal details that the officer ought to know. Um, you know, this is especially dangerous because, uh, want for one, face recognition technologies still aren't very accurate. Um, so there's a danger of misidentification, um, of identifying an otherwise innocent person um, as having an open warrant. Um, and uh, it'd be, uh, I think, uh, officers would need to be extremely cautious because, you know, they're standing there right in front of that person uh, with a gun um, with this new information that, you know, the person could be dangerous. Um, so the upshot here is that, you know, by adding biometric technologies together with cameras, um, this will be a huge change in the nature and purpose of body cameras and not what communities probably expected when they said, okay, 
our department should adopt body-worn cameras. Um, it's going to turn, turn these cameras from uh, accountability tools to, you know, clearly investigative tools. And, you know, my fear is that this is going to change the nature of public spaces, um, especially for individuals who are already in the system or associated with people who are already in the system. Um, some departments, Baltimore, Boston, have put uh, limited, um, uh, have put some limits uh, in their policy uh, against the use of facial recognition, which I think is good. More departments need to do so, even though that technology isn't uh, there yet, uh, because it's coming, um, and uh, communities and advocates uh, need to get ahead of that. So I'll stop there, pass things over to Seth, and happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Harlan. You pass me the keyboard. Yes. Yeah. And thanks, everyone, for having me at the NACDL. I'm happy to be here and excited to talk about this stuff. Uh, I'm a trial lawyer from Berkeley, California. I am a member of a three-lawyer law firm, but I was a public defender for Alameda County and practiced mostly in Oakland for uh, the nine years prior to that. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll say this. I have a strong opinion about body cameras. I think they're the single best advance in police technology. For, for trying to find the truth between police and community interactions. Um, one of the things you learn as a public defender is it, or as any criminal defense attorney, uh, there's an unbelievable imbalance between stories officers tell and stories clients tell. And as you are in the courtroom, you notice how uh, fact finders like juries, jurors and uh, judges react to police officers versus how they react to your clients. Um, you can imagine the typical police officer who is a professional witness who's trained to testify comes in in a shiny uniform with a shiny badge, hair freshly done, bright smile, usually knows the people in the courtroom. Good morning, Madam, Madam Clerk, knows the, knows the court reporter. Judge says, hi, good to see you again. And the jury reacts to that. Here's a truth teller coming in. Jurors, uh, who are often suburban and white, uh, are making decisions about what happens between police officers and urban black and brown you know, children or young men, and uh, they're looking for the truth. And oftentimes, or I'll say 100% of the time, they look to the police officer to tell them the truth about what happened. Uh, and that's a, that's a disaster. That's a disaster for urban uh, young men who are being ensnared in the, in the criminal defense uh, the criminal justice system. Um, so when I far first started seeing body cameras, and they started rolling out really even in 2009 in Oakland, uh, all of a sudden I could see some way to authenticate and to acknowledge the stories of my clients who are typically in custody, in shackles, in a jail uniform telling me, no, 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 that's not what happened. The police report isn't true. He was screaming at me. He took me to the ground. He beat me up in front of my kids. And I could uh, previously only say, well, that's not what the police report says, but now I had a video. Um, one thing to remember about police officers is that the police officers who work in urban areas and who deal with people they consider thugs all the time often are thugs themselves, uh, often want to treat people uh, like they are the boss of the neighborhood. I've had police officers tell uh, young black men, I've never seen you before and this is my neighborhood even though they travel 60 miles into the neighborhood to patrol it. Um, where, so people have to identify themselves to the police officers to explain their own presence in their own neighborhoods. Um, so, what, you know, of course body cameras catch our clients at their worst, but they catch police officers at their worst too. And the community and the jurors and the judges already hate our clients. And so what I like about body cameras is it starts to push the narrative in the other direction. I play body camera footage uh, as much as possible, even if it captures inculpatory evidence, bad evidence for my client, because it reveals the truth about the interaction. And it takes a little bit of the veneer away from the police officer's presentation as a professional witness and reminds the jury or the judge that this is a person who works on the street, who talks differently on the street, and who acts differently on the street. Um, let me say this. The, uh, the, the big things we use body cameras for are to find uh, and what we need to do to prepare for body camera use in court. Find discrepancies between police reports and the videos and then just to find offensive conduct. 
uh, conduct that we see all the time, the way that police officers treat our clients, but that the public and the judges don't get to see and make an officer explain it. Even something as simple as why wasn't your camera on? I had a, uh, a preliminary hearing last week where an officer didn't uh, turn on his body camera for the search of a car where he found a gun in the car. Uh, and I confronted him with the city's policy about body cameras. And while I was going to confront him with the city's policy, I showed it to the DA and she said, where'd you get that? Because she had never seen the policy either. I said, public records request is the best. Uh, so I had the policy for body cameras. The DA didn't know what the policy was. And the officer, you know, even just in front of a judge, when I said, look, the people of the city, of, it was in Vallejo, California, paid to get a, 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 a camera on your chest just to record this interaction. The, the taxpayers, they're looking to see what happened. And the policy says you, and it said, I read it to him. You shall turn on the camera during this situation. And uh, the officer said, uh, shall does not mean must. Oh, my goodness. And you just kind of let that sit in the air. <laughs> and you say, yeah. So, like, so you made a choice. The people say shall, and you said, not me, not today, not when I'm confronting a young black man uh, on the streets. So even just confronting, a po giving a police officer, uh, forcing them to explain uh, their own contradictory actions against a policy makes for intense courtroom drama, which is what I'm here for. Uh, <laughs> so three case studies from recent practice. I'm going to show you some narratives from police reports and then show you some videos of those exact interactions. Let me set up this first one. This is a Vacaville police. Vacaville literally translated as cow town is no longer a cow town, uh, but it is a suburban white area with a very attractive uh, outlet mall. And so uh, sometimes people from urban areas come into outlet malls and the police don't necessarily uh, like to have people from urban areas coming from outlet malls. We'll get into that a little bit. So one is uh, a, a response to a domestic disturbance. One is a how to issue a ticket for a citation for driving on a suspended license. Um, and the third is actually a, a d police responding to a noise complaint. I think every single uh, one ends up in the use of force against uh, poor black clients. Uh, this is my client in the first example. Her name is Cora Cotton. She uh, is a nursing student in San Francisco. She has no criminal record. She's never been arrested by the police, never been detained by the police. The information that the police had in the, uh, in the video you're about to see is that there was a disturbance at the mall. And by a disturbance, I mean a group of black people showed up. Uh, and um, Cora Cotton was involved in a fist fight. Now, it, it seems pretty apparent to me, having talking, spoken to Cora and also just watching the video, she got beat up by her boyfriend. She is a domestic violence victim. It's pretty obvious to me, and you know, I think it will be to you when you watch this video. She doesn't want to talk to the police. She is acting shameful. Uh, she doesn't. She she just wants to go home. She's calling her mother, um, but. There may have been a call that she threw a punch or, or, uh, or was involved in this altercation, so the police are trying to detain her, possibly, for getting into a fight. Uh, and you'll see what happens. But let me, let me give you the narrative. So um, we're going to go through the report a little bit. Uh, before we do that, let me describe these officers. These are the largest, whitest officers you can imagine. The officer who is the primary officer in this case is like six foot four, white woman with long blonde hair and a set of pink handcuffs. I've never seen something more offensive than pink handcuffs, because at what point do you want, do you care about the color of your handcuffs? All right, so here is, uh, here is the narrative. It's a little long, I'm gonna read it because I think it's important. Subject was reported by store employee at the outlet because she was punching a man in the face. Upon my arrival, I saw the male driving away and provided his vehicle information and direction of travel to incoming officers. So note that the officer uh, broadcasts, I guess, the male victim's information and direction of travel. Uh, unclear why she would feel that was necessary. As I stepped away from my marked patrol car in full uniform, subject fled away from me down a driveway into an alley and to the end of the alley where I drove to her and stopped in front of her. Subject initially refused to stop, but in but eventually stopped. She began making phone calls, refused to provide ID, saying she didn't have any or anything with her name on it. She refused to offer her side of the story. 
refused to offer her sort waving me off and telling me she had nothing to say. These are, these are, this is offensive to a police officer, not, not explaining her presence in this outlet Malta. Upon the arrival of my cover officer, I told her again to hang up her phone, and she refused. She was on the phone with her mom. We attempted to detain her, but she swung her arm around, and we fell to the ground as I was attempting to handcuff her. At the time, I was telling her to stop resisting and to give me her hand. She pulled her hand under her and refused to give it up, and I was concerned she was reaching for a weapon. This is a woman alone at a shopping mall. So I struck her in the face with the hand that was holding the handcuff. You may be familiar with brass knuckles. Uh, the first thing that happens, Ms. Cotton gets punched in her face with a hand cuff. So she is essentially battered uh, with a deadly weapon, or assaulted with a deadly weapon, which is a strike and prisonable offense. Uh, the officer doesn't go to prison here. So, um, she, but eventually we're able to pull her hand out and handcuff her. My left arm was locked outward. This is the officer. We fell. It hyperextended because it hung up on the electrical box. I heard and felt my elbow snap. I thought I broke it. Fearing my arm was possibly broken, I knew we needed to get her detained quickly to prevent further injury. She still had not been searched. She was strong. I'll tell you, I've never seen so many police officers in recent reports describe black people as strong, like very strong. You know, like we've got to be careful. This is a strong person. You know, this is a, this is literally a, a nurse, a woman who has, she has no reputation for strength other than by this officer. Okay. I was telling her to give me her hands. She was not. I still had the handcuffs in my right hand. I punched her in the face with my right fist, glancing off her forehead. I was not trying to punch her forehead, but she turned her head back toward me right as I was swinging. I was hoping to distract her with a strike so we could gain her compliance. She screamed but didn't comply, choosing instead to continue pulling away and pulling her hands underneath her torso. She twisted her head and part of her upper torso up towards us, fearing she may be reaching for weapons. I punched her again, this time on the left side of the head with a heel palm strike with my empty right hand. She told me she could not give me her hand because it was stuck under her. I grabbed her by her hair to force her face away from me to prevent her from biting us or spitting on us and turned her face back downward. I realized that with my full body weight on top of her, she may not be able to pull her right hand from under her. So I adjusted my position to accommodate her. And guess what? She removed her hand when the officer stopped putting her entire body weight on top of her. Now we need to make sure we understand what happened to the officer. During the fight, my prescription glasses were knocked from my face. Uh, both heels of my hands were scuffed. The outside of my right wrist was swollen. Both knees were scuffed. I had a scratch, about a quarter inch long and crescent shape. Uh, and if you're at home right now, try to, make, try to show what a quarter inch scratch looks like with your fingers. Um, and uh, uh, it was just below her pinky. Her, her elbow was sore, but it wasn't a problem, and she did not seek medical attention. Not one mention of the injuries to Miss Cotton. Let's play the video. For those in our live studio audience, I have the video here. Are we muted? Okay. We got a call that you were hitting a guy in the face. Get off the phone. Where your mom at? All right. All right. Can you tell her to hurry up? Why are we getting a call that you're punching a guy in the face? I don't know. Okay, give me your ID. I don't got my ID. You don't have anything with you that has your name on it? No. What's going on? Nothing. I'm just trying to go home. See if the ex is uncooperative behind that Adidas. Are you on probation or pro? Uh, I'm not. I'm in nursing school and I'm just trying to go home. I just want, I don't need none of this. I'm just trying to go home. Whether you need anything. it or not, you got it. I didn't create this. And I didn't either. It, somebody did. Okay, well, somebody, I, I had a bunch of calls that you're over there punching some guy in the face. Right. I don't know what happened. Oh. It's your time to give me your turn, of the, your <laughs> side of the story. Well, who the, who's the guy that you were hitting in the face? I wasn't hitting Get off the phone. I'm trying to call somebody. It's time to hang up the phone. I need to call somebody so they can come and pick, pick me up. Can you get your... Stop. It's not going to go well for you. Let me talk. Can you get your... 
Turn over. Roll over. Let me just touch your butt. Roll over. Ah. Give me your hands. <laughs> Give me your hands. I can't. It's, it's twist. My face is in the ground. I can't. Give me your hands. I can't turn it off. I'm laying on it. <laughs> Ow. Can I twist Give me your hands. I'm trying to. Give me your hands. <laughs> Pull your hand out. <laughs> My arm is stuck under me. I can't. Pull it out right hand. now. I can't. Pull it out. Please. <laughs> If you hadn't sat there and resisted, nothing would have happened. You guys don't even know what happened and you're treating me like this. We're trying to figure it out, right? Yeah, but I just got... Man, you just... Man, y'all don't even understand. This one is... Like, man... Oh, my God. I did not to nobody. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my can you answer that to my dad? No. Ouch! What are you? Can you just tell me what to do and I'll do it? We already tried that. That didn't work. Did okay. It? Well, my face is bleeding. <laughs> So a couple of things to, to, to um, take away from that video, video, excuse me, that video. First of all, my client was arrested for two felonies, felony domestic violence, uh, which wasn't filed on. There was no evidence of a domestic violence and felony resisting arrest, uh, disobeying an executive officer. Um, like I said before, she's never been arrested. She's never committed a crime. She didn't commit a crime that day at all. Uh, and she was charged with two felonies. She had to pay a lot of money to bail out. And uh, the district attorney would not dismiss this case until, uh, well, they wanted her to plead guilty to something. We refused. We did a preliminary hearing uh, and watched this video in court with two officers standing there, uh, and the judge dismissed the case afterwards. Um, never condemning the officer's actions, never saying the officer acted improperly, uh, but actually uh, trying to find a sort of legal techni technicality to dismiss the case, which I gave him um, uh, based on essentially in, for felony, uh, felony resisting arrest, you have to have some, some use of force against an officer. <laughs> and, sh and obviously it's clear that uh, Ms. Cotton was using no force. Uh, against the officers. So he used that. He said, officers did everything right here by the book, but I'm going to dismiss it based on the lack of force against the officers. Uh, so a classic moment where a judge won't confront uh, a police officer's wrongful acts, but will s still see them and find some other way to find justice. And that's something that absolutely would never have happened without a video of the interaction. A couple other things to keep in mind. Um, can anyone imagine this interaction going this way if this was a white person? If this was a white woman who may have just been a domestic violence victim who's walking away from a police officer, who'd be taken to the ground, put her face into the dirt, and grabbed her hair? Uh, after the, she's put in handcuffs, the officer takes her purse and starts going through it and dumps the content onto the dirt. Um, just like you might during a robbery. I mean, it's something so demeaning. Uh, takes her lipstick and throws it on the floor, takes her school ID and throws it on the floor, and just kind of, uh, you know, treats everything about uh, her as like she is completely uh, not even a human being, right? I mean, you know, you can't sort of get more, uh, <laughs> more offended by police conduct than in that video. Um, so, Couple questions after watching a video. Does the police report accurately reflect the conduct? I mean, does it really sound like this was a woman who was, by the way, fleeing down an alley? There is no alley. It's like the edge of a 
outlet mall parking lot uh, who uh, was really re resisting in any way, shape, or form. I mean, there's no resistance at all. There's simply a woman being assaulted uh, by a police officer. So how do you use the footage? You have to make sure uh, that it gets played in its full, that you don't stipulate to its contents, that you make an officer watch it and make an officer explain it. This officer, after showing her the video in court, was actually, first time I've ever seen it, apologetic on the stand. She said, I didn't mean to hit her with my handcuff. I didn't know it was in my hand when I I was doing that I didn't actually didn't mean to to really use all that force on her it just kind of escalated like she was almost sorry about it when she got onto the stand which actually is extremely and exceedingly rare um, Miss Cotton had arrived at this outlet mall with two men uh, one of whom was a supposed attacker or victim uh, the police, because they got the, the car information <laughs> as it was departing, uh, one officer shared it with the other, so they stopped the car also. Uh, they found out that one of the men was, uh, this is the alleged attacker or victim of domestic violence, was driving on a suspended license. So uh, they told him they were going to tow his car, and then uh, and we'll see what happens. So this is the same police department the same afternoon against the same family. Here's the police report. I contacted S, that's a different S, who is not seated in the back of the Mustang. I told him that S2 was far too intoxicated to drive. So they actually tried to find a driver for the person so they wouldn't have to arrest, uh, arrest him or cite him. O Officer McDonald would be completing the citation for driving on a suspended license. Subject became very upset that his car was being towed, so he quickly got out of his car and walked away east. By the way, there is no uh, rule that requires you to be physically present for a uh, infraction citation. You know, you can get written for a citation, you can throw it on the floor, uh, and if you don't show up to court, they could issue a warrant for your arrest. But you don't have to necessarily be there or be compliant or do anything. This guy wants to walk away. They already have his ID. All they have to do is mail him the citation. But that, that wasn't going to um, that wasn't going to be good enough for the officers. I ordered subject to stop. I told him we need to give him a citation. Subject continued to walk away and refused my repeated commands for him to stop. Officers Bohm and Pro ran after subject with me following. I saw Officer Bohm and Officer Pro catch up to subject and attempt to detain him. The subject began swinging his arms, attempting to pull away from the officers. I again gave repeated commands for subject to stop. He refused and continued to struggle with the officers. This is the other family member of this other woman. Officer Bohm attempted to take him to the ground by grabbing his upper body and pulling him down. He was unsuccessful. Officer Pro and Officer Bohm tried together to get subject to the ground and were able to get him partway down, but subject pushed Officer Bohm away, causing Officer Bohm to fall to the ground on his back. Subject continued to actively resist. He was very strong and muscular and was resisting all efforts to detain him. This is the second person in this family who is very strong. Uh, subject was on his knees, but I felt it was very likely he was going to regain his feet and continue to fight. I was concerned that I, Officer Bohm, and Officer Pro would be injured. So what do we do? Let's play video two. Here's the deal. We're going to have to tow the car. You got no license? No, his brother. He's he's like a point two oh. He's like three times the legal limit. No we can't keep we can't keep playing this game. We're trying to be cooperative as as cooperative I'm as we can. I, and I get that and I appreciate that. But, but we've made every reasonable effort. We're not going to keep finding other people to drive the car. You three were in here. You're driving without a license. We got to we got to tow the car. So I have to get you guys to get back out of the car. He's going to finish. Filling out the site for so the drive without a license. My car got to get towed because he wanted to. No, no, your car's getting towed because you're driving without a license. Uh, Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, oh, sir. Up, sir, yeah. we have to give you your citation. Yeah. Fuck. Going, no. no. Oh, fuck, McDonald. Yeah. Hey, Stop. Hey. Oh, God damn it. Stop. Stop. Wait, wait. Oh, Stop. that bullshit. Stop. Stop! God damn it! Back off! Taser, Back off! Taser, Taser. Taser. Wait! Roll over on your stomach. Roll Stop! Your stomach. Hold her back there. Get on your stomach. Get on your stomach.
All of them are going to go. He's going to go for 148, the other guy in the back of the car. Got him. Check He's okay. Yeah, I'm watching him. Okay. What I need you to do, uh, Frank, go talk to those people right there after we get them in the car. Make sure they don't take off because they were watching it all. I was recording at the same time. So much. If she needs to go, then take her too. You right? So uh, this is the other family member from this family that went to the outlet mall that day. And uh, he seems to have learned from his life as a black man not to be confrontational with officers. Maybe just to walk away if he's kind of angry. They're going to take his brand new Mustang and not get into a fight. Uh, so he is so upset and um, non-confrontational, he decides to walk away. This is a citation, this is a ticket, this is a moving violation, this is like going through a stop sign. This is like a red light camera. You know, take a picture, send it in the mail, there is no need for a confrontation, there is no need. But for a police officer, when someone walks away from you, it's disrespectful. And uh, if you want to have complete control over that person or send a message that, that when that person comes to your town, uh, they're going to have to obey your commands whether they are lawful or not, uh, you want people to stop. Now, I, I could have easily shown this video in a taser presentation because tasers are a tool used when someone is so extremely dangerous that they are uh, in, the police officer is in danger of losing their life or uh, getting a serious bodily injury to themselves. This is a man walking away. Uh, so giving him uh, a 20,000 volts of electric shock to his back because he didn't want to receive your citation when you're still going to take his car, he doesn't know that his girlfriend was just brutalized by the same police department and is being taken to jail at the same exact moment. Uh, this. <laughs> Citation was obviously eventually dismissed, but the damage has been done. You know, look at the relationship between the community and the police, and how do you explain it? Does it really look like, uh, going back to the police report, does it really look like this is a man who is resisting, this is a man who is throwing people to the ground, he was extremely strong? Not at all. He actually has no desire to have any physical contact with these officers. It's super clear. He wants to walk away. When they start jumping on him, he kind of is, shakes them off a little bit. One of them falls down. Uh, but, but he has no intent to hurt anybody. Um, and this is a, a good example of looking at a police report, finding inconsistencies, and then playing this footage so that judges can see how these officers are acting in the street. And by the way, I would play this footage. I would not take a dismissal on this case without a motion to suppress. I want, to, I want this video played. I don't care uh, whether or not they want, to, they want to get rid of it. I'd rather have the officer or a judge see this so that the next case when this officer comes and makes an arrest, they have in mind how these officers are acting on the street. We have to get these videos played, of course, with our client's permission and our client's interests in mind. Let me just do one more um, because uh, in the city of Vallejo, having a loud party like a frat party in another city. Um, I don't know how to say this. Gets a, gets a response like you would expect maybe in a war zone. So this is a apartment complex where there's been a loud party and people have poured into the parking lot. So it's loud. The entire population of the party are young and black. And the entire uh, <laughs> uh, police force that shows up are sort of tattooed white Vallejo police officers. And um, the way that they, uh, the way that they interact with the community you'll see is, is just almost incomprehensible. So first there's a peacemaker in the crowd who comes to the officers and tries to explain what's happening and we'll see what happens to him and then we'll see how police officers just go into the crowd to try to control the situation. Um, and what I might do because we're running kind of low on time is just is go through this pretty quickly. I want to I want to show two final videos, um, and then we'll be all done. So here's number one. 
This is example number three on my presentation. I then heard Officer Thompson say, put him in cuffs. I turned my attention to a person, subject. I saw him standing in front of several officers. Subject then began taking off his sweatshirt and clenching his fist, which led me to believe he was going to attempt to fight the officers. I reloaded my taser with a new cartridge, but just prior to deploying my taser, Officer Murphy grabbed onto subject. Uh, Officer Murphy then changed his position, which allowed me to deploy my taser safely in an attempt to, to neutralize and stop subjects resisting. Officer Murphy was then able to put subject in handcuffs. So the first video is just um, 20 seconds. It just shows the this young man saying hello to the officers as they're responding to this melee, and then the and then it sh and the second video, which we'll play back to back, is the officers sort of confronting him when they when they feel like he doesn't is not playing by their rules. So let's play those videos. What's the situation? Nah, man. It's to this is what, shut up. You know what the situation is. You, 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 you looking at this shit like I'm looking at it. Don't play with me. Oh, okay. I just, well, you, you wanted to. Okay, you came up to me. I was just asking. I'm talking to him. I said she's to you. What is your okay. name? Murphy. So you're, you don't hurt here? Okay, it's time to go then. Get back! Get back! Get back! Turn around! Hey, turn around! Turn around, put your hands behind your back! I told you to, you're under arrest! Get back! Stop resisting! Um, so I think, you know, when comparing the, the police report to the video in that example, here's a guy who is, I mean, I really think he's the peacemaker of the group. He is the only one talking to the police officers. He walks up to them. He says, sir, you, know, you can see what I see is happening here. He wants to sort of be a liaison. And when he doesn't sort of get out of the way, because they're about to do some things, by the way, which we're going to see in this final video. Um, he he is they say him to back up back up he does back up he does back up he's doing everything right and then they are just tired of him uh and they take him to the ground again no risk of any harm to them uh and they tase him really absolutely for no reason whatsoever this is exactly what we worried about what we what we got worried about when tasers were deployed that they wouldn't be used in life or death situations they'd be used just uh, to physically control a certain segment of the population. And it's pretty obvious that's what's happening. Uh, there's one more video, and it is, uh, <laughs> it is a young woman who's my client who's also at this party, and, sh and you'll see essentially what the officers do to go into a group of women, all young, all black, uh, to try to get them to sort of comply. It's very hard to hear. These officers are sort of saying, if you don't live here, you have to leave. But everyone's already there, and it's a party. And although the police are there, I don't think it's clear at all what the instructions are. There's no use of a bullhorn or anything like that. And so the officers eventually get frustrated, and they go into the crowd with their batons and with their tasers. And, and then what happens is um, young women are trying to sort of help defend each other from being assaulted by police officers, and they just continue to assault them. So one more party guest, subject two, subject two was secured in handcuffs. I could see other Vallejo police officers attempting to take subject three, that's our client, into custody as she had approached my back as I was arresting subject two. I saw subject three kicking backwards at an officer's groin area. It's 
uh, you'll see that's not true at all, uh, and saw officers were attempting to gain control of her arms. I heard one of these officers sell, tell Subject 3 she would be tased. I feared she was going to assault an officer by kicking him in the groin area. To prevent an assault from occurring, I used my baton. I delivered one jab strike to her right side area. It actually turns out it's a flashlight to her throat. Uh, I de-escalated my force <laughs> as the strike appeared effective. Uh, and she was placed in handcuffs. Let's see if that matches up with this final video. Go ahead. Get back. Get back. This is my problem. Get back. You don't let me in the pussy. I'm going to get pussy. Now you're going to jail. Put your hands behind your back. Put your hands behind your back. So, um, you know, what you see there is an assault by police officers on multiple people, and then anyone who tries to kind of get involved also gets assaulted. Everyone, I think they arrested maybe 15 or 20 people for um, resisting arrest. Uh, and um, our client's case was dismissed, but not until the day of jury trial. They never would offer her anything like a dismiss it if you stay out of trouble or any, anything. Uh, they wanted to have a trial, they wanted to have a trial, they wanted to have a trial, so we showed up ready for a trial and they dismissed the case. Uh, showing again that the system is designed to, even if you're going to unlawfully arrest people, just abate them into taking plea bargains, turn themselves into criminals, uh, and then use those prior convictions against them in the future. So these, this footage is invaluable to me and to uh, defense lawyers across the country at showing how these officers are acting. These officers, when they show up to court, they look like community heroes. They look like they are protecting us, that if something goes wrong, they'll be there. Uh, and uh, when we, these, these videos have, I think, finally allowed us to uh, bring some light into what happens at night. Uh, in urban environments and even in suburban environments when these officers are uh, actually interacting with the public. So uh, I think, like I said in the beginning, uh, I think the, the footage uh, and these videos are uh, so important to revealing the truth of these interactions and, uh, and I think that they can be used to our advantage and to our clients' advantage at every step. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you to our panel. Uh, again, if you have questions, you can email them to me at jmusa at nacdl.org. Um, I actually already have a couple of questions for you, so we can get started right away. Um, the first question I have is, are body cameras like records? Admit part of a record and the entire record is admitted. Defense was admission of body camera number one, which is favorable to defendant. Does that authorize the admission of body cam number two, which is not favorable, or can they be considered admiss admissible separately? Well, yeah, I think the doctrine of completeness kind of addresses that, and so I think it's Rule 601 uh, under the federal rules, um, or 106, rather, 106. So if uh, the finder of fact ought to con uh, contemporaneously look at the remaining uh, video or the other portion of the video so that uh, there's a full context of what happened, uh, then it would be admissible. So that's always kind of something for us to keep in the back of our mind. If I want to put this portion of the video in, how much it, uh, is it going to uh, allow the prosecutor to put in? And, you know, how can I foreclose? When can I shut that, uh, that door? Great. And I would just remind people that in your materials that you received, if you've not had a chance to look through them, you do have the NACDL report as well as a number of sample motions. You have the body camera scorecard and the civil rights principle. So that material should be in your inbox um, in it, from an email from, I believe, yesterday. Uh, so the second question we got is a question, it's, there's actually two questions in this one. The first one, though, is about consent issues. So can people refuse to be recorded? Are individuals notified that they have a right to not be recorded from the beginning? It, 
depends on the jurisdiction. So some uh, uh, some departments uh, do require their officers to notify uh, the people they interact with. Some not. Um, it even uh, depends on the department whether or not recording happens in the house, uh, in a home, or not, and whether they need to get uh, they need to get uh, permission. Um, and so, yeah, it, it just depends on the the local rules. Yeah, and the the task force recommendation was that especially if it's in a house, the officer should ask permission. And if somebody declines and says, I want to have the video turned off, that that portion of their advisement that they have the right to have the video turned off and their statement that they like it turned off should be recorded. Great. Uh, the second question uh, from this person is on destruction of recordings. So what happens to all the mundane recordings that are of very little evidentiary value? How do you know that it has been deleted? Is there a time limit? And how can citizens find out that, a depart that department policies have been followed and recordings deleted? So I think you know, part of it is technical in the sense that how do you know that deleted really means deleted? And the other question uh, seems to be a time limit question and ensuring that they are complying with that time limit. Right, so that's the importance here of audit logs. So each piece of video footage will have an audit log of when the footage was recorded um, when it was uploaded, when each person looked at it, when it was scheduled for deletion, um, and then finally when the actual piece of footage was deleted. Um, those audit logs uh, ought not go away, right? That's the record of the fact that footage had existed at some point. Um, uh, but yeah, the audit logs, uh, f you know, the, the taserevidence.com system by default has audit logs that happens automatically without anyone have to do an having to do anything. So that's an important safeguard, uh, technological safeguard that's already in place. Okay. Uh, next question is, are there standard forms of discovery request to ensure we are getting all available footage? Uh, I will again say there are some sample motions in your materials, but I will turn it over. I think there are samples, but I, th but I think uh, what Harlan mentioned is, is important because what I like to do is request not only the footage, but the audit logs. Um, and try to do that in coordination with some public records request to get the actual policies to make sure what you're getting is what they actually have and if there's other logs that the department keeps and maintains that you also ask for those through the discovery process they don't make it easy to do this i mean even in my even in alameda county there's upwards of 15 police departments so each department has a little bit different rules and what they maintain and what they provide and no one wants to provide through the discovery process their policies god forbid uh, so you do have to tailor your request to the jurisdiction. You got to do some learning to figure out what it is that each jurisdiction maintains. And what I typically do is see who who arrived at a at a crime scene, and if ever if an officer arrived, there should be a video tagged in of what they did. So you kind of just make a list, and see if you, uh, all of them have been uploaded to evidence.com. Recently, I had one that wasn't so until I interviewed the officer. He's like, "Oh yeah, I forgot," and uh, so. Uh, there is a motion to compel in the materials, and uh, uh, that's the best way to kind of track it, see who showed up, and they all should have one tagged in if that's the current policy. I'll also point out in the materials there is a sample public records request as well. Um, the next question is, uh, are you aware of any citizen police review or oversight boards that are helping to formulate policies on the body camera issue? Yes. Well, in Albuquerque, there, because of the D Department of Justice stepping in and, you know, uh, grant, uh, given our current administration, we don't know how much the Department of Justice will be involved in local jurisdictions going forth. Uh, but uh, the Albuquerque did set up a citizen oversight board to look at excessive force claims, and that involves uh, the review and the maintenance of body cameras. So s some jurisdictions are doing it. Us as criminal defense practitioners, we want those those people involved. But, uh, so I'd encourage everybody to contact whatever uh, kind of oversight there is. And if there isn't one in your jurisdiction, talk to your city councilors, talk to the mayor, uh, and talk about having one created. Certainly that's a broader issue. I mean, it, the, the effectiveness of citizen oversight groups obviously varies from, from place to place. Um, but I think, uh, you know, ultimately, one of the main problems with body-worn camera development is most departments don't even talk to communities at all. There's very little feedback um, in, in, in terms of you know walk, talking to the communities that we actually be impacted uh, by cameras. Um, and so, uh, you know, in most places, departments will negotiate with their unions 
um, and should, it, it comes as no surprise then that the policies that eventually get put into place uh, more often tend to favor unions and departments and not the communities that they represent. Okay, so the next one is a sentencing question. Um, this person wrote in, I showed a video of excessive force by an arresting officer at a sentencing hearing. I thought it would mitigate the alleged resisting charge against my client. The judge slammed my client, gave a lecture about disrespect to police officers. Any guidance on handling sentencing scenarios? It's an interesting question. I mean, it's an interesting idea to, to, play, <laughs> to play a video of an officer's excessive force. I mean, the problem with judges, which is why we you know, we don't trust judges to make serious decisions like uh, guilty or not guilty. We use jurors for that in this country. But um, but the problem with judges is that judges, uh, in especially in state criminal courts, are um, are sort of are sort of numb to the abuses faced by criminal defendants because of the volume of cases that come through the state courts. So judges. Um, I think are not a good audience necessarily to give compassion to criminal defendants because they're so tired of hearing people's excuses and they see police officers as the only respectable people who come through <laughs> their courtroom. So uh, it's hard. You got to know your judge. Uh, you might float uh, in that situation. You might ask your judge whether a video of excessive force would be persuasive before playing the video. But uh, judges. Um, especially outside the context of excessive force cases, like unless you're the plaintiff um, and you're suing the police, in which case judges uh, tend to have a role more thoroughly or more deeply uh, in that decision. They tend to excuse police officer conduct because they know it's a hard job and they have also seen the tough characters, quote unquote, that police have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's hard. Uh, I think you just have to be careful and know your judge. Okay, so I know uh, we've been going for a while. I want to thank our panelists and give you each an opportunity to wrap up. I know you all have talked about things that all of you know about, so if you have sort of any final parting thoughts. Sure. So this is Barry. Um, I, I would just say take take the lead in your community because this is going to have long-term uh, impact in law enforcement and how uh, the police are held accountable in your communities, and it really matters. So get ahead of it. Uh, read the report. and. Uh, uh, get uh, get a coalition built. Yeah, my main point is that you know accountability doesn't come automatically just because a department decides to put cameras on the streets. Um, the mat that the policies that departments put in place uh, matter a lot, um, and so this is why the NACDL report is so important because I think by following a lot of the recommendations, we'll uh, have policies that uh, I think are more balanced. Um, that actually respect the rights of individuals in the community um, and will uh, also help uh, cameras actually meet their promise of providing some measure of transparency into police community interactions. I agree and, and I echo my panelists here. I think uh, my, my takeaway point to those out there who are practicing criminal defense and have body cameras in their jurisdiction are let's get them into court, let's get people to watch them, let's show them to our clients, let's show them to their families so that the conversation can start shifting a little bit away from how, um, from sort of the murkiness surrounding the relationship between police and our clients and shed some light on what's actually happening. Even if you're going to lose the case, the fact that the client can see how they were acting that night or the family can see or that someone can see what actually happened uh, allows for us to create some uh, element of trust in that there's some truth to the story. We actually know what happened rather than uh, the breakdown in, in community police uh, relations that comes from the mystery in that relationship. Okay, so I'm going to reverse myself and that we did get one more question, and I think it's an important one. So uh, the question is, I recently received a redacted video as part of Jenks. I've requested the entire video. Um, <coughs> are there recommended ways to technically redacted a video so that the evidence is not completely distorted? Are there ways to compel the entire video early on in the litigation? So, you know, I get us two parts. Um, I'll address the technical piece. Um, I'm not sure exactly in the jurisdiction that the, um, the questioner is in exactly uh, uh, which vendor is, is providing the body camera system. I do know, for example, for a taser system, um, that uh, when, a de uh, when a department is releasing video and has redacted video, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, overwrite the original video, right? So they always have the original video, then there might be copies that are redacted or are clipped 
or um, or something. So the original video should be there, and I'll leave it to these guys to answer the the, the other question. Well, you know, a real uh, red readily available solution is ask the judge, hey. Put a protective order over it. I just want to be able to see it. So whatever security concerns there are, or privacy concerns, have it be in one of my cases, it's just attorney's eyes only. Not even my client can see it because of security, uh, you know, danger issues. And, um, and just assert all of, uh, you know, the Brady and discovery rights due process rules. All right, so with that, I am gonna thank our panelists once more. Um, I will say again, ch check through your materials. You'll find a lot of this information in there, and this uh, webinar will also be up on our website probably within the next couple of weeks. Thanks so much for joining us today.